Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about does ADHD lead to dementia? So as usual, I'll talk for 20, 25 minutes. This video may well be longer than that because there will be probably questions at the end, both on this topic and other ADHD related topics. And I will jump into the take home message, which is what I usually start with. So the take home message is there's reasonable concern about whether ADHD leads to dementia. These are both brain involved processes. ADHD usually is considered a neurodevelopmental process and dementia a neurodegenerative process, but both affecting the brain. And there was a study that came out at the end of 2023 claiming that there was at least a 2.8 fold increased risk of developing dementia if you have ADHD. Now I will get into it later that that's only one of several studies. The studies have varied. Some saw, found no association whatsoever between ADHD and dementia. Some have found similar a risk increase of approximately two to three times higher among the ADHD population. Um, but often if they controlled for where factors such as mental health issues, depression, anxiety, or physical health issues like diabetes, all of which are higher in the ADHD population. In almost all studies, the associations shrank in size. Um, again, they may disappear completely if we have all the important variables controlled for. Um, so there's little evidence to date that may change that ADHD is directly leading to most forms of dementia. I'll get to one possible exception. It's like that the association, if there is one, is more related to factors of what are called cognitive reserve, which means people with ADHD may have less flexibility, less resources in brain resources to rely on or to fall back on when a degenerative process starts or progresses so that the symptoms of the condition, the dementia condition, are apparent earlier or more severely for the same extent of damage, that's probably part of it. And reverse causation is almost certainly a factor in some of these studies. And reverse causation means that dementia is actually causing symptoms that look like ADHD and, or maybe even causing ADHD itself, I think not likely, but that causes at least confusion between the diagnoses and it's not ADHD causing dementia, it's dementia causing ADHD-like symptoms. So some of this I talked about last week. So last week's videos on medications used to treat dementia. Um, the important aspect I wanna jump on here is we're saying dementia as sort of one entity of a degenerative condition, particularly of the brain, particularly focused on language, memory, attention, emotional regulation leading eventually to complete loss of intellectual, social functioning and physical body functioning and to death. Um, it's this, depending on who counts or which year, the sixth or seventh leading cause of death in America right now. And as the population ages, it's only likely to go higher. Um, the most common form of dementia is Alzheimer's, which most experts say constitutes two thirds to three quarters of cases and in the early stages seems to focus on acetylcholine containing memory based circuitry in the hippocampus. Um, it's characterized by deposits outside of cells, brain cells called beta amyloid plaques and taut fibrillary, neurofibrillary tangles within nerve cells. And that is still the way the definitive diagnosis is made. So you need either biopsy samples or an autopsy, there are right now um, several research groups who have pretty far along in developing blood and um, cerebral spinal fluid and brain scan PET studies looking at the deposition or factors related to amyloid beta and um, top protein problems. So very soon we will have better methods for it diagnosing it. So one of the big problems is that when we say more than 5 million people, Americans have Alzheimer's dementia right now, actually the number is usually six and a half million. 
a lot of those people have not been definitively diagnosed that Alzheimer's is the cause. We're sort of extrapolating <clears throat> from what we know. So the other big thing is that Alzheimer's is a major contributor to the biggest lump of dementias, but there are most dementias or many dementias seem to be combinations of different factors. So vascular dementia by many countings is the second most common, probably one of the most common combining forms of dementia combined with the other types. And it's essentially due to tiny little strokes in the brain, small little blood vessels blocking and causing restricted blood flow. I'm gonna jump back to Alzheimer's. So what I will say is that so far, none of the basic pathology, either at a neurochemical or neuroanatomical level, we can identify with ADHD is, can, is overlaps significantly with what we see in Alzheimer's. <clears throat> so that makes a direct connection, not impossible, but less plausible. On the other hand, with vascular dementia, we know that there's several factors. So increased blood pressure, obesity, are increased risk factors for developing vascular dementia. And we know that ADHD does increase the likelihood of developing hypertension. I have another previous video on that and of obesity. So there's maybe slightly more plausible, but it's an indirect pathway there, not a direct evolution of ADHD into dementia there. And then there's a third type of, there, there are several other forms of dementia, but I'll just address Lewy body dementia. And that's one that there's some speculation. It may be more closely tied to ADHD. There's at least a few tiny studies suggesting um, a five-fold increased risk among people with ADHD to developing Lewy body dementia. Um, so Lewy body dementia is characterized by molecular structures called Lewy bodies found in degenerating nerve cells. And some of the nerve cells, not at the very beginning, but close to the beginning or that are commonly destroyed in Lewy body dementia are dopamine containing cells. And there is a strong dopamine involvement in ADHD. Um, so again, the dementias on the whole are a varied lot and except for the possible connection with dopaminergic cell damage in ADHD and Lewy body direct dementia, not a direct obvious pathway from one to the other. And the other time course issue, again, we think of ADHD as a neurodevelopmental issue that it's showing up early in childhood by definition now before 12 and most individuals probably starting before 12 years of age and often earlier with a strong genetic component, but also clearly environmental influences. But for most individuals, from what we can tell, again, about a third of kids do seem to largely outgrow it. Two thirds continue to have either substantial or full-blown ADHD throughout their lives. And by young adulthood, the common dogma and understanding is the degree or extent of ADHD symptomatology is fairly stable. It may change dramatically symptoms if you are faced with a situation that's either increasing the demand on you or decreasing the support and structure in you. But it's thought that the basic characteristics, brain characteristics, cognitive characteristics of ADHD are pretty stable through adult life. It's hard to conceive, not impossible, of a scenario or, or a mechanism by which there's Again, market delays in development in certain areas in the first two decades of life, and then stability for decades before you're seeing from that same process a decline later in life. Um, so, again, not impossible. So, um, so, so, what when I gave a similar talk on this channel, and I'm going to be deleting it because this is updating it. Um, the only big study had, that had been done was one or the biggest and best was a 2019 study done in the population of Taiwan. They looked at almost a million subjects. They studied them over a 10 year period. And when I say study, they are pulling records from a, a medical insurance company database. They're not going out and interviewing people. They're not 
individually following up over time. They're just pulling records as to what's getting reported in these people's files. Um, so in that study, they found that, and it's skewed towards a younger age group, but about five and a half percent of the people with ADHD developed dementia during the 10 year follow-up of the study. Um, but only 4% of controls did that. So in the study, they pulled out the people who had ADHD, they matched them on as variables related at gender, age, some other important variables to get three controls for every person with ADHD to compare them to. Um, and they calculated the odds ratio of hazard ratio of 4.0. So they presented it as you're four times more likely to get ADHD or to get dementia if you have ADHD than if you don't have ADHD. But if you looked at the, the numbers, the numbers were 5.5% people with dementia, 4% of the controls develop dementia. That's not something to jump up and down about. That's not something to fret about that if you have dementia, or, I mean, if you have ADHD, that you're 90, only 95% likely to get through the next 10 years without develop dementia versus 96%. It's a, it's a statistically significant difference. I would question whether that's a clinically significant difference for any individual facing it. And some other big issues with that study is that they actually had very low rates of ADHD diagnosis of about 0.2% of the population. That's not consistent with rates of ADHD in studies both in Taiwan and elsewhere, which find usually rates at least 10 times higher. Um, and this is a population that skewed young. They didn't give the average age of either sample or control groups. Um, they, they listed what percentage were 55 and younger and which percentage were above 55. But the overall rate of de dementia in the samples, the whole study sample of about a million subjects, a little less, was only 0.1%. So you could argue that one were probably missing really most of the case of ADHD. So we don't really know what's going on here. And we're probably looking too early, too young an age to really meaningfully tell us who's developing ADHD. What it says, I guess, at a reassuring level is most individuals aren't developing dementia during the time course of the study. So since my previous talk, there was a study in 2021 or maybe it came out, but um, published in Sweden, a Swedish population looked at an even bigger sample size of three and a half million people. And they found a hazard ratio of about 2.9. So again, several studies have found your risk of developing dementia is about two or three times higher than other studies have found no increased risk if you have ADHD than if you don't. But in this study, when they controlled for mental health factors, they controlled for depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, substance use disorder, all of which are more common in people with ADHD, that hazard ratio dropped in half to about 1.6. Again, not, it's certainly significant at a population level. Again, if people are studied for a longer period of time, there may be bigger differences we find, but given again, the absolute risk being quite low in this population of dementia, whether that one and a half times increased risk of developing dementia is meaningful for a given individual is probably not. Um, so I'll get to the third study I want to talk about in a little, in a few more seconds. So, we, so we've talked, so in terms of a relationship between me, uh, ADHD and dementia, the possibility is there's no real connection, but that, that I'd say the available data is possibly consistent with that. There could be a situation where ADHD is a precursor or is a prodromal set of symptoms on the way to dementia. So it's the same disease process. That again, seems quite unlikely from the data and from the time course, but if there isn't real association, and again, some studies find it, a lot of that connection between these two variables is probably that ADHD contributes to both mental and physical health problems that themselves are risk factors for the development of, of 
dementia. So, and many people put other variables higher on the list, but the two I would really highlight is that sleep dysregulation, sleep dysregulation is really prevalent in ADHD. It really contributes to or exacerbates lots of the dysfunction for many individuals with ADHD. But the more we look, the more we are, the greater the evidence that sleep, poor sleep, disrupted sleep isn't just a manifestation of dementia, or a, but it is actually a precursor and there's a very plausible pathway where this contributes because the garbage system of our brain, the glymphatic system, we know is only active when people are sleeping and not just when they are sleeping, when they are sleeping at nighttime. So it's a circadian and sleep regulated system. And even when many people with ADHD are sleeping sufficient hours, they're often sleeping erratic hours. If you're impairing your garbage sweeping system, again, you are probably, and, and there are some tiny direct studies looking at this, less effective at sweeping away the amyloid plaque that's depositing between neurons or the ta fibrillary tangles that are being deposited within neurons. So sleep deprivation is a possible mechanism that's important. Head trauma is probably another really important one. So head trauma, even single loss of consciousness involved with some post-traumatic symptomatology is almost always a sign of some substantial inflammatory processes going on in the brain. Even if someone recovers from that, that may have kindled some slow growing, brewing inflammatory processes in the brain or caused damage at the time of head trauma that are the targets for inflammation arising at a later point in life. Um, we know that ADHD is substantially increased with developing or, or getting into situations where you have head trauma. So those are two very plausible connecting but indirect routes. Other mechanisms, so we know ADHD is associated with poorer diet, with obesity, with less exercise, with diabetes. All of those are in themselves associated with higher rates of developing dementia. How many of those are causative and how many of them are just associations? We don't know, but again, ADHD is associated with increasing all of those. I'll point out that the diabetes could be a risk factor for um, dementia in part and, and why it's associated with ADHD may have to do not just with diet, um, lifestyle, exercise, sedentariness, but also that both ADHD and diabetes are at least in part autoimmune conditions. And there's again, increased um, rate of autoimmune conditions in those who have ADHD. Other behaviors related to ADHD are associated with higher rates of smoking, higher rates of depression and anxiety, lower socioeconomic status are all associated with ADHD. They're all also associated with developing dementia, which again makes teasing out whether ADHD is having any direct role harder. So the other possible connection rather than sort of a causative or an indirectly causative role is the concept of cognitive reserve. So the concept here is that with a brain that's developed with ADHD, you may have fewer pathways, you may have fewer neurons in certain pathways. So once you start causing damage by neurodegenerative dementia processes, you more quickly run into trouble because you have less of a backup. So it's not actually changing how much damage is done. It's not changing the fundamental pathophysiology of the dementia process. What it's changing potentially is that you just have less brain to fight back against with. And again, that, that this is a factor for some of what we consider protective issues re related to dementia. One of the previous videos here is on ADHD and multilingualism and bilingualism, or sorry, it's on. And in that video, I talked about that there is fairly good evidence that people who are multilingual for a the same amount of brain damage seen in measured by amyloid plaque deposition, um, seen in a monolingual person, the bilingual person, 
needs to have a substantially greater amount of brain destruction before functionally they're showing the same level of impairment. So that's an, it's not that learning French or Latin or Mandarin have fought back against a dementia pathophysiologic process. It's that you just have more brain there to deal with when part of your brain has been damaged. So another possible connection between ADHD and dementia is what's called reverse causation. And that is not just that ADHD is causing dementia, but dementia is actually causing ADHD or ADHD-like symptoms. So from what we usually think that, again, ADHD is a childhood developmental process, AD or dementia is something that's happening at the end of life. But we know from studies of people with rare genetic strong familial forms of a, uh, Alzheimer's dementia that trauma or not trauma, damage to the brain through neurodegenerative processes, deposition of beta amyloid and top proteins is happening at least 20 years before clinical symptoms develop. So we know for many, many people, they are walking around with early aspects of dementia going on in their brains and they're not showing it or looking at it. So reverse causation is that, you know, maybe if at 55 or 60, you start showing problems with tension, short-term memory, forgetfulness, that may not be actually a new case of ADHD showing up. It may be more that this is how your dementia is actually beginning to present itself. So with that, that's a good introduction to the Israeli study that was published at the end of 2023 and got a fair amount of media attention as claiming that ADHD, and once again, is causing dementia or is associated with it. And the Israeli study looked at more than a hundred or about a hundred thousand people who were in a insurance company database. They looked at them. So there's a birth cohort from people born between 1933 and 1952. So the good thing is we're looking at in general an older group of individuals more likely to be developing ADHD and again compared those with ADHD to those without it and found significantly, and I don't have the exact number in front of me, something like two and a half to four times higher rate of developing ADHD or developing dementia if you already had ADHD. Now, why this study to me is a completely bizarre and I would argue almost meaningless study is what they did. First of all, they, they an exclusion was people who at the beginning of the study, and I, they, um, and again, they're not following individual, they are following records of people. So there's problems with major problems with ADHD diagnosis and dementia diagnosis, even though the paper assures us they had good clinicians in this mental health plan who are making good and accurate diagnoses. One thing they excluded, they, they claimed that there is a distinct childhood ADHD and an adult onset, they didn't say onset, but adult ADHD that are completely distinct from each other. They, I think, repeatedly miscited a New Zealand paper from several years ago that it's a pretty tortured interpretation of that study to make that claim. So because of this belief that, that there's two separate conditions, childhood ADHD and adult ADHD, they eliminated from the study anyone who had ADHD at the beginning of the study, which again, most people are around at least 50 when they entered the study. And when you looked at the data, they were only eliminating two hundredths of a percent of people who had an ADHD diagnosis. So they are wildly under picking, under detecting ADHD in this sample population group. When they looked at those with adult ADHD, again, it was less than one tenth, or less than one percent of their population. Um, So again, if they are missing so many cases of ADHD and, and only looking at those who only developed ADHD as adults, one is that's just not relevant to the vast majority of people who both 
clinically what I see, clinically what every other clinician, psychiatrist, psychologist, social worker who works with ADHD sees is a vast majority of people who as adults manifest ADD symptoms manifested them during childhood. Whether we can document that rigorously or not, but in almost all cases, the, the record is there if we look for it. Um, so it's not even clear what who the study was looking, how we can generalize it to anyone else. Um, it, it does go to the last point I was going to make, so that one of the big issues of sorting out whether ADHD causes dementia or not is that there is lots of confusion, lots of overlap between the diagnoses. So we usually think or frame ADHD is an attention problem. Dementia is a memory problem, but those are in some ways meaningless terms. So let's look at forgetfulness. I say Sally comes in because she's misplacing objects. She's forgetting where she put her glasses. She goes into the next room and can't remember what she did. Those symptoms, one, is it attention? Is that she's not paying attention to what she's doing and lose track of it? Or is it memory that she was paying attention? She registered, she formed a memory of what was going on and that she couldn't retain that memory or retrieve it well enough to find these objects, know where she was going, knowing what she was doing. Again, we're breaking it down into attention versus memory, but I'd say at a symptomatic level, they can look exactly the same. And if we're gonna jump into this, depression can cause this type of symptomatology. Anxiety can cause this type of symptomatology. So in addition to this forgetfulness, absent-mindedness, difficulty multitasking, difficulty planning, are all symptoms of emotional regulation problems are hallmarks of both ADHD and dementia. It makes it really hard to sort them out. Other things, so I talked earlier that some of the particularly Taiwan study looking at generally a younger population, dementia rates are pretty low. If on the other hand, you're singling out an older population, you're gonna have lots of problems with recall bias. If you talk to an 80 year old, they may well have lots of problems recalling if they had ADHD symptoms at an earlier point of time. Um, and there's also problems with obtaining collateral information to find out, did this person, you know, his mother, brother, sister alive to say, yes, they were acting like this at this early age. So I think all these studies reflect that our diagnosis, particularly in insurance company databases, we are almost certainly missing both a lot of cases of ADHD. We're missing a lot of cases, you know, not just a lot numerically, but a high proportion of people who have dementia. So drawing conclusions from the people who did wind up being identified with those conditions, were they much more severe than others? Was it their clinicians were more astute? What was going on? It's hard to know. So I think I will wrap it up there. I was going to talk about what you can do about these variables. I mean, so get good sleep, avoid head trauma, exercise, eat, remain socially active and intellectually active. Again, how many of those really change the course of dementia and how many of those are more serving to preserve what brain function there is or enhance that? It's a cognitive reserve issue, hard to know. I will throw a question out here, and that is this topic isn't just of general interest to many people. This topic of confusion between ADHD, dementia, and just normal aging is of critical importance in the US presidential elections coming up. And my question is, is it worth devoting a whole section to whether either Joe Biden or Donald Trump are dealing more with normal aging, dealing more with fake news media bias, dealing more with ADHD, which I think objectively there's a strong case for both of them having had that, or is it dementia or some combination of all? Um, some people have suggested I steer away from this topic entirely as too politically laden. Others want me to talk about it. So if you want to vote or put your opinion in, I'm happy to hear it. And I'm seeing lots of questions, so I'm going to jump to them now. So hello again, Mr. AK 1996. And it looks like I can see all your question this time. 
He's heard that NSAIDs reduce the risk of dementia through limiting microglial activation. Do you think maybe modulating microglia through a safer way like no dose naltrexone could help prevent dementia? Um, so this is a big field of, there are so many different things that contribute or that are associated with higher rates of developing dementia or not. Actually, one of the more recent ones was the erectile dysfunction aids like Viagra, which um, phosphodiesterase inhibitors do seem in really well done study to reduce the risk. Um, so even if NSAIDs reduce the risk, is it through microglial activation? Is it just through overall reduction, reduction in inflammation? Because everything I see suggests that a large part of the development and progression, regardless of how it starts, of Alzheimer's dementia in particular, but other dementias as well, is an inflammatory process. So is it their inflammatory action? Is it other actions? Um, whether or not a low dose naltrexone is safer in all dimensions than NSAIDs, I, I, I would say we're dealing with a lot of unknowns there. That's where I would leave it at. Um, so corpse, Corpsman Kind um, says that my, my title does is ADHD linked to dementia. I would say, again, from what we are seeing so far, and not just my assessment, there's a 2023 summary, I have not yet included that in the references that said their assessment of the data so far, this was a qualitative analysis, not a quantitative uh, meta-analysis, was that there is, as of yet, no convincing demonstration of a link. And again, if there is an association that's found to be apparent, they think most of the data so far suggests that it's, again, indirect through a host of factors which ADHD makes more likely that that then increase or are associated with the increased risk of dementia. Again, how many of those, even in those associations, are causative? And that at an absolute level, even when people are throwing out things like three times greater risk, hazard ratio, the Absolute risk is, again, at, at age 65, different studies suggest 5 6% of us have dementia. But again, analogy from these studies is that may increase your risk to 6 or 7%. Is that a meaningful risk factor for you? Um, so when we say NSAIDs are harsh on the liver, though, right? What I would say is that many people tolerate them well, but yes, at a population level, there are many people who have liver and kidney problems with them, particularly over time. Ah, so J. Rodolfo Rodriguez, Yaquez, I'm sorry, I don't pronounce things well. Can erectile dysfunction meds, Viagra cells, help reduce Alzheimer's dementia? Does it have to do perhaps with blood flow? I heard about it on the news. So, Yes, there's a study I've looked at. I didn't review it right before I talked today. It was fairly rigorously done. There were a few other suggestive studies that support it. Whether it's through improving blood flow, which is one of the factors of these drugs, that looks like a plausible mechanism. Um, clearly, we need more data on that. So, hello, Dennis. Um, welcome back this week, or welcome today. Is there any good literature saying that benzo should not be used to treat anxiety besides their addictive potential, which I briefly looked at and seems pretty weak in the general population? So there are at least three very large, very well done by my reckoning epidemiologic studies. I don't have uh, countries or numbers done right now, which showed measurably increased risk and the risk was about the same as it, it's about a 15% higher. That's not the absolute risk. It's that again, if at age 75, let's say 10% of people in your control group have Alzheimer's or dementia, a 15% higher. So that would be 11.5% of people who are on benzos are developing dementia at that age. So, so there are several studies, well done. There was at least one equally large study that failed to find and control for proper variables that did not find this association. 
Um, and, and these were people who were taking benzodiazepines for at least a year. I would, again, many people seem to jump to, well, the latest study didn't find a connection. Well, you still have to figure out how you are going to accommodate that with the three previous studies who were also well done and found a connection. I, I would say three independently done studies to me are more worrisome than one study not finding a connection. So, and again, at an individual risk level, is that particularly high? No. Um, is that a population level significant factor? Yeah. So other problems with, with benzos long-term is that particularly once you get to a certain age, they are statistically absolutely associated with a higher risk of falls and breaking bones. And we know that often physical decline in the elderly, particularly the very elderly starts with a or severe catastrophic physical decline, often starts with falling, breaking a bone and then person's in bed and never recovers walking other functioning. So there are, that, that certainly is one other <coughs> risk with using chronic benzodiazepines for treating anxiety. Um, Corpse and Kid asks lower socioeconomic SES. Um, so yeah, I might have, so, so we know that Lower socioeconomic status is actually associated with higher rates of developing ADHD, whether it's that symptoms are more severe or whether it's a confounded between lower socioeconomic status and people who are already genetically parents having ADHD is not completely clear. We also know though that kids who have ADHD are more likely to decrease their socioeconomic status as they become adults because of disruptions in education, disruptions in financial earnings. So, so ADHD itself has an increased risk for creating a lower socioeconomic risk status for you. And we also know that lower SES is associated with higher rates of developing dementia. Again, whether that's an association, whether that's a cause and effect, is not clear. Um, so next question, how do you know or tell the difference when someone is having a senior moment or senior lapses in dementia? Is there a threshold? So my somewhat flippant answer here is that probably Google, Apple, Microsoft, and the others have a much better measure of this. They are collecting so much data on the intricate, intimate details of what you're clicking on, how long you're looking, how long you go back to double check. I bet they have pretty good data on this happens six times a day versus 17 times a day, or you're measuring also your rate of clicking and other things to have a much better marker for who's already in the, what we would say are preclinical stages of dementia or the MCI, the model mild cognitive impairment stages, then we're deciding clinically. So I, I'm going to make a wild. So some amount of retrieval of memory problem does seem to be part of normal aging. Some aging specialists say there's no such thing as normal aging. It's all a sign of pathology and that if we did jumping jacks every day and ate our Wheaties, I'm being really flippant there. None of us would ever develop these problems. I, I, that's an exaggeration. But, but there's some evidence that just the longer you live, the more you have stuffed in your brain, the harder, the slower the retrieval process is going to be. So there is some normal amount in aging. One, and this is a clinical gross overgeneralization, but if someone comes into me in their 50s, 60s worrying, I'm forgetting things, I'm forgetting things, and, and can describe in exquisite detail everything they're forgetting, that's not usually how Alzheimer's presents. So with Alzheimer's, often apathy is showing up as early as measurable, detectable, at least on simple tests, memory problems. The person's making more mistakes, they're forgetting things, they're getting lost, they're leaving things out, but they don't really care. It's like, so what? Why are you making a big deal of it? This is, again, a gross overgeneralization, but 
it's sometimes helpful in terms of steering further questioning or examining more closely. It's not an absolute test, but worry and concern and exquisite detail about forgetful moments is not necessarily a strong indicator of Alzheimer's clinically. Um, so would it be due to, so I think Corpus Man Kid is getting back. I think I've already addressed that. Would, would be low SES be due to poorly treated ADHD leading to poor psychosocial functioning, low impulse control? Yes, all those things do seem to be the pathway. Um, again, some of it though, it may be confounding because ADHD we know has a strong genetic component. If you're growing up in a, you know, a family of people with ADHD who are already lower socioeconomic status and you are learning different behavioral patterns or where they're not, I won't say the word corrected or realigned with what society is expecting. These are really complex issues to tease out what's cause, what's effect, what are just confounding variables. Um, so Herman or Herman Musimbi, are you aware of the MIND study looking at the effect of nicotine and Alzheimer's dementia? If successful, could nicotine agonists be successful in the memory impairments of ADHD and general AD? So I'll break that down into separate issues. There are, there's a long history. So, so nicotine is a weird stimulant in that it is both reducing anxiety or calming as well as measurably helping with alertness attention. Um, there have been drugs that were fairly well along in development that were nicotine agonists for the treatment of ADHD. None of them have come to market. So very clearly nicotine can be helpful in many individuals with ADHD. Now, certainly if you're smoking cigarettes, if you're chewing tobacco, there are toxic elements that I would argue in almost everyone outweigh any of the benefits, whether nicotine gum or patches are a cleaner way. That may be, but but we don't have a lot of rigorous testing to show that. Um, and again, there is evidence that nicotine in people at high risk or who are in mild cognitive impairment may be successful in addressing it. Again, whether it's helping you make better use of what you have left or whether it's really slowing down dementia processes, I, I think it's more likely the former. That still would be and I don't want to poo-poo that or diminish that. That's still a great thing, as we talked last week with the drugs about, that are used for Alzheimer's. Again, maybe with the lowest, newest class of monoclonal antibodies directed at MLA beta, we are finally interfering with pathological processes leading or along the evolution of dementia. But even the first and second waves of drugs that were addressing symptoms or effectively helping you get better use of the brain you have left, those can provide clinically meaningful help in delaying the state or how long someone's able to function independently or enjoy many of their hobbies or activities in life. Um, so do you know of any drugs on the market? Very good question, Herman. Not that the others have been good questions too. I just, I'm not well practiced in positive reinforcement for question givers, I should. So I thank all of you for contributing. You've clearly spent time and effort thinking about these things and these are on target and pertinent questions. Um, do I know of any drugs on the market that aid the lymphatic system in the clearance of plaques or tangles? So there is yes or no. So, so what I would say, there's actually a study, and I'm not remembering off the top of my head, of one of the DORA drugs, the dual orexin antagonist that's in my previous video on those. I, yeah, I'm not, I don't want to say the wrong one. So, so these are drugs like Belsamra, David Joe. Um, so there's a study there, there, there's animal research with the DORA drugs that there's clearance, greater clearance of plaques and tangles from animals that have been on these drugs. There was a single short-term small sample size, but in that small, very short duration of treatment, 
there did seem to be measurably greater clearance of amyloid beta and I think both markers of tau as well as beta um, from use of those drugs. There are no long-term studies in human. There are no direct studies, I, I believe, showing what the mechanism of, whether it's actually making the lymphatic system more efficient or whether it's just that getting better sleep helps you, helps, I mean, again, sleep and circadian rhythm factors both seem to be important for allowing the lymphatic system to be turned on. So whether it's allowing the lymphatic system or actually enhancing the lymphatic system are interact interrelated but separable questions. Um, ah, so, so E1025, thank you for bringing up a point I didn't get around to. I was getting long in the discussion. So E1025 asked, do you think stimulant medication use for ADHD increases dementia or Alzheimer's risk? So one of the interesting side finding, and they did multiple partial analysis in the Israeli study published at the end of last year, was that although in their study with this category of adult onset ADHD, increasing risk for dementia, they actually found that stimulant medication in the setting of ADHD did not show any increased risk for developing dementia. So there's claims going both way and minimal data. So the claims are that these are drugs that increase attention, increase performance ability, not just again in ADHD, but there's a fairly significant number of studies in looking at cognitive impairment from brain trauma and finding that stimulants and Ritalin has been looked at more extensively, but Adderall amphetamine products as well do enhance cognitive performance, attention, memory measures in the setting of ADHD or ADHD-like pictures. So people, so their claim is that this may well, again, whether it's helping your brain make better use of what's left, probably that's what it is rather than changing the process. Um, the other claim is that these are, you know, there's certainly animal data, there's certainly street stimulant data at dosages that are much farther, uh, larger and probably causing excitatory neurotoxic damage that stimulants can be damaging to the brain. Almost all of that evidence, again, is that bigger doesn't seem to be directly pertinent to therapeutic levels of prescription stimulants. We may develop data down the line that, that disagrees with that or changes that, but right now, so the claim is that, that stimulants are bad, they're causing brain damage. Um, I will eventually get around to doing this talk, but the last I looked more than two, three years ago, there were more than 30 studies looking at kids with ADHD, were taking stimulants during childhood versus kids with ADHD who were not taking stimulants during childhood. Virtually every study showed that brains looked more normal, no cases of brains looking worse off in the, by the end of adolescence, by young adulthood. So unlike the common belief, these are drugs that rot your brain, they're destroying your brain, at the end of childhood, for people who took stimulants had brains that looked more normal. We can get into arguments or discussions as to whether a normal looking brain is actually desirable or not. That's a separate question. But the evidence, I mean, is actually turns the argument actually on the head. That, I mean, it suggests rather than stimulants being damaging to kids' heads in terms of the specifically neuropathology in their brain, it may be that you are consigning your kid to a lifetime of ADHD by not treating them. Their brain is more likely to look abnormal, aberrant by the end of young adulthood when after which time it's not that there's no neuroplasticity, but there's less ability for the brain to change. So that looks like I've exhausted the questions. I probably exhausted me and this video is probably gonna be longer than anyone with ADHD wants to look at. Um, so I'm glad I started with the warning that I'm probably only talking for half that time and answering questions after that. So thank you so much. You've been wonderful. I'm glad 
if there's so many people listening in. If you like written views on some of these topics, um, I also have a blogging, writing, um, say on medium.com, it's under my name. Um, I won't push it further here. So stay healthy, stay happy, and have a great week. I'll be back next week and my memory is exhausted. So I am not, I don't have in front of me which topic I know there's only two more weeks this Tuesdays. One of them is going to be on, is there association between LGBTQ and ADHD? And I'm not sure what the other one is. So I don't know if that's next week or in two weeks. That's all.